in Colossians 3, 1 through 11. Uh, why don't you guys go ahead and stand as we read uh, this section of Scripture. We're continuing our, our study in verses 5 through 11, but it, we, we are going to read 1 through 11 in chapter 3, uh, and we're continuing the study uh, call, call it, uh, titled Off with the Old and On with the New. This is part two. Most of tonight is going to be talking about Off with the Old, and we'll get into the putting on the new a little bit. We'll touch on it. And then after verse 11 through 17, uh, it goes on and talks about what that looks like practically in our life, putting on the new man. Um, and so the first four verses that we're about to read are doctrinal, meaning they, they are things that uh, they're teachings, they're instructions, they're uh, to talk to us about how, who Christ is in our life and where we stand with him, uh, spiritually with him. Then after that, it gets into the practical side of things. So it goes from doctrinal to duty, uh, is the way to think of it. Uh, but that's, that's uh, and then from now on, it's going to be talking about the Christian life, what that looks like practically and how we live that out. So uh, I'll read this. Just go ahead and you can follow on the screen as well. Uh, it says, if then you were raised with Christ, you can also read it, since then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. And then therefore, meaning because of all everything that was just spoken about in the last two chapters and in the first few verses of chapter three, therefore, here's what we're called to do. Put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desires, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. But now you, you yourselves are to put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth, and do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in the knowledge according to the image of him who created him where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, or slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Holy Spirit, Lord, I would ask that you would, you would reveal the deep truths in this, this passage of Scripture. Lord, how we can apply it to our lives, Lord, if, and what that means to, to actually apply it to our lives, and that it actually renew our minds and our thinking and our how we view ourselves, Lord, that our, our identity would be not uh, in who we were, once were, but that we are made a new creation in you, that we are in Christ, and that's the life that we're called to live, that you would actually increase our faith. You say faith comes from hearing and hearing the word of God. And so as we hear your word today, Lord, I pray that our faith would be increased, increased in you. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys can have a seat. Again, off with the old... On with the new, part two. Uh, and there's this, throughout scripture, we see this, this dichotomy, these, uh, this you were once were a certain way, you were the, the old man talks about it. We'll go over several different passages that talk about the old man, and then several verses and passages that talk about the new man. But there should be, in every Christian's life, in everyone that is a true Christian, follower of Christ that is converted, that has been regenerated and the Holy Spirit dwells in you, a moment, a time in your life where you were uh, enlightened to the fact that you have sinned against a holy, perfect, righteous God. That you come to this realization that you've messed up that not only have you messed up, that you're messed up. And that's not to, and we're all messed up, as we'll look at in these verses. And no matter how hard 
that, Chris, that person or you have tried, no matter how hard you work, no, how, no matter how many good deeds you can do or, or no, no matter how many good deeds you could accumulate, that you will forever be marked and stained by your sin. Romans 3.20 says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. That there has, as, as a follower of Christ, as a Christian, there has to be a realization that you're in need of a Savior. That there is something that you are in need of being saved from. And it is sin. And it is this sin that separate, separates us from knowing true love. It's this sin that separates us from knowing true peace or true joy. That that sin is what separates you and me from God. Not just in this life. Not just in you now breathing But that sin is enough. Even just one sin is enough to separate you from God for all of eternity. And in fact, it's because of your sin, it says that you are not not only separated from him, but you're at enmity with God. And so there comes this realization like, what do I do? If If I can't fix it, and I have all this huge problem that that it's hell without God, it's, it's, I, because of this sin, I'm going to be separated from him from all of eternity. What do I do? And this isn't just to point the finger at anyone. This is, we're all in the same, same boat, so to speak. All of us in this room, all of us in the world, all of us that have ever existed. It says in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All, everyone. In Romans 6.23, it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Every Christian, every true Christian knows, knows this, that they're in need of a Savior. But God, out of his love for us, sent his, own, his one and only begotten Son, to die for us, to be the sacrifice, the atonement, the payment for our debt that we owe because of our sin. That whoever believes in Jesus should not perish but have everlasting life, John 3.16 says. In Romans 10, it says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Saved from that sin. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. That this is the gospel, this is the good news, that you cannot earn your way to heaven, you cannot be good enough. But yet we live our lives in such a way where we forget our, the desperate need we have for a savior. God is good. Titus 2 says, who, Jesus, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed. Not just some, not just the ones he picks and chooses, but he's, came, he's come to redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, He saved us. It's according to his goodness. It's according to his love that he has saved us. Through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. That when you place your faith in Jesus and what he did at the cross for your sins and you say, I I need you. That at that moment, you become saved. You become regenerated. Colossians 2.14 says, Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to, to us. It was against these, these, this long list of laws and sins that we had committed. And he has taken it out of the way, not only taken it out of the way, but then has nailed it to the cross. 
2 Corinthians 5.20 says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that what, that, read it, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That this, this last part, that you might become the righteousness of God in him, is how God sees you. That he has made you holy. That he has justified you. Just as if you've never sinned, that he's given his righteousness to you. And it's not because of how good you are or what you've done. But your faith in him. There's this, I was reading this on Got Questions today and I thought it was good to, they said it well and just quote them. It says, grace is not God doing 95 or even 99.9% with us making up the difference. It's kind of how we feel sometimes. It's how we kind of think of it. That that God did 99.9%, and we, but we still have a part to play when it comes to the forgiveness of sins. Grace is God doing 100% and our humble acceptance of it. Recognizing that we are unworthy and that we have nothing to contribute. It says our good works are like filthy rags to him. They're... they're they're no good. And we just read in Titus that, that we are called to do good works. That, that there are good works that come out of our lives, that God has a plan and a purpose for us, and that he's actually going to work in your life to sanctify you, that you, that, that, uh, that you can serve him and love on his people, and he has a purpose and a desire for your life. But this, when it comes to sin... All those sins that you committed and that you will ever commit, that's part of the old man that is dead. We just had our baptism, water water baptism down in Corona Del Mar. We talked about that uh, two weeks ago. But that's just a symbol, an outward expression of what God has already done on the inside. When someone gets baptized, they're confessing to the world that they're in need of a Savior, that they've accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and they're identifying with Jesus' death when they in burial. So when you go under the water, full immersion, the death and burial, and then when they come out, they've, they've been born again. They're a new creation. And this is important to get. It's like I, I had to cut verses out of the study because throughout the New Testament, it's talking about this old man and this new man. Don't live like the old man anymore. Don't be like the old man. The old man's dead. Put the old man to death. Like that is gone. It's done with. You're a new creation in Christ. Live this way. And if you just take 2 Corinthians 5.21 and you recognize and live by faith that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, that when you're in Christ Jesus, God sees you righteous, there is freedom that comes from that. There's liberty that comes with that. That you're, it's, it's, not, it's no longer about that the sin issue has been dealt with by the blood of Jesus Christ. And your faith is in that. Now, do we still sin and mess up? Yes. And as we'll recognize, the old man is still peeks his head up. And so practically, what are we called to do? We'll read here in verse 5. We're called to kill the old man. It says, therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth. Put to death. This word, put to death, in the Greek, it's an active imperative verb, as we learned last time. It means to kill or subdue the body through self-denial and discipline. To take action now, not, not tomorrow, not in a week from now, not in a couple years, but now, to take action to kill the old man. And every time you feel your pride peeking out, every time you see yourself being selfish or you have a bad thought or you, you, you just know it's the old man, you kill it because it's already dead. Think of like a zombie or something that just keeps on coming back, right? You got to shoot it in the head. It won't come back. To take action now and kill those parts of you that are anti-God. It means to mortify it. Do it now. Uh, the word members here, it's the parts of the body, your ears, your lips, your eyes, your hands, your mind, every part of you that, that is 
that could have a sinful desire. You know, when we come to Christ, it's, uh, it's not like we just stop sinning. Now, some people come to Christ and maybe they had a problem. Like I know friends that had a problem. They just had a really filthy mouth. They cussed all the time or they had a problem drinking or smoking or whatever it is. And when they came to Christ, it was just gone. Praise God. And then other parts, other friends, other people, it's like they didn't have that. Like they, they had to like really work at like not cussing anymore, not saying those things, to, to renew their mind in the word, to, to fill their mind with God's word and what is true, what is noble, what is, what is of good report, and to, to really like have God's word renew them. But inside they knew they were saved, but they still dealt with this old man. And so there is a part to disciplining that old man, to, to putting to death. Are there areas in your life that you know that you could think of right now that are unpleasing to God? Now, those things that are anti-God, those are sin. That's sin, right? When we just, I just spent the last, what, 10, 10 minutes giving you the gospel, recognizing that the old man is dead. God sees you as the new man, right? That you are righteous in him that you are a new creation, and by faith, that's how you're supposed to live. But you're like, but Joe, I still sin and mess up. When you just said, hey, do you have, a, you have that thing that you struggle with? And you, you knew exactly, you could list five different things off. What do I do with that? Well, you ask for forgiveness, which he already does forgive you. And you say, that's not who I am anymore. I'm looking to, the, I'm looking to God. I set my mind on, on him. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, and I will get up by faith and walk towards him. But sin, sin, our own pride, Satan, wants us to keep us, keep us away from God. Instead of when we mess up, when we sin, when whatever it is, we have that bad thought, we, we want to like run away from God. We want to like, I don't want to go to him. I don't deserve him. Yeah, you don't, none of us deserve him. Or maybe you like your sin too much. You have to think of it as that that's the old person. That is not who you are anymore. As I started meditating on this, as I started living in the truth and what God's word said, I started to sin less. Did I stop sinning? No. But I, did I become sinless? In God's eyes, positionally, I am sinless, meaning I don't have sin. I am covered by the blood of Christ. But I still sin, and I now start to sin less because of them. And I also find more desperation, more of a need. I have a better understanding that I am in need of a Savior. Like, I knew when I came to Christ that I needed him. But now I know that I really, really, really need him. <laughs> Does that make sense? That we should grow in our, as we grow in our understanding, as we grow in the knowledge of God, and as we grow in our understanding of who God is and what he did on his, uh, when he sacrificed his son, when we grow in the understanding of the gospel, there's power in that, and that, that creates a humility, a desperation, a, a yielding, a getting on your hands and knees and saying, God, I need you. And he's, his grace is sufficient. And so you get up and you walk with the Lord. It goes on and lists what those different things that come out of us in the members. It says fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. And because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. I'm not going to go through defining all these things again. You can go on YouTube when it comes out. I think it'll be out in the next couple weeks and look at that because I want to get through the next couple points. But just, I want to touch on a few of them and, and give you, if you look at this list and the progression, it starts with fornication, the outward uh, expression, what actually the, the, the um, immorality, it's the, the, physical, the physical part of what's, already happened inside the heart. That the old man, the sinful man, that needs to be put to death, the members in your body that are, that are in there, that the outcome is this, fornication, immorality, the, the word pornea in the, in the Greek, 
It's where we get our English word pornography. And it means anything, any unlawful sexual relationship, anything that is outside of um, the way God, God designed sex and marriage between a man and a woman. So anything. You can ask me, what about this? What about that? Anything outside of the way God designed it between a man and a woman that are married and a covenant between them, <clears throat> them and God. Okay? But notice, it says fornication, that's how it ends. Uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. At the end of that list, it's where it begins in the mind. It begins in the way you think. It begins in you wanting something, you desiring something that you don't have. And then it goes from that, that covetousness to then an evil desire where you're consumed with this thought, that this, this thought of a lustful thought, or it can be any thought, just an evil desire that is anti-God, anti-Christ. And that, that evil desire, if you entertain that and you don't actually put that to death, it then turns into a passion that is uncontrollable. And that uncontrollable passion turns into an uncleanness and then eventually into fornication. And we see this all, all throughout. We, we just turn on the news. You just open up Instagram and you can see this. <clears throat> it says, because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. God is perfect. He is holy. He is righteous. And he is just. And he will punish all sin. He will punish all of your sin. He will punish all of my sin. He has to. The question is, is your sin covered by the blood of Christ? John 3, 36 says, He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. There will be a, a day of reckoning. There will be a day of judgment. We will all have to stand before God alone and give an account for everything that we've done. But by the, by the grace of God, by his goodness, by his love, he's given you the free gift of salvation. All you have to do is receive it by faith. And maybe you're like, how do I do that? <laughs> you simply cry out to him. Say, God, I need you. I recognize that I'm a sinner and that I need you, Jesus. You don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to have it all figured out. That's where it starts. And the beautiful thing is that you, you think you have this problem of sin, and that's all you're trying to figure out and deal with. But the sin was what is, again, separating you from God, that there is a deeper more joyous, more peaceful, more loving relationship that comes out of that. That the sin, now that the sin is removed, you can come into a fellowship, into a communion, into that re loving relationship with God, and He begins to go to work in your life. And it is the most fulfilling, most awesome, most beautiful thing that you could ever experience. But listen to this in verse 7 of, verse, of chapter 3 in Colossians. It says, In which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. That you yourselves were once sons of disobedience, but now you have come to Christ and you're a new creation in him. I love it. It says you, were, you once walked. Meaning that it's past tense. First Corinthians 6, 9 says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, nor, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. You were one way before, and now you are another way. Set free. Galatians 5.24 says, 
those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And if we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Here's the practical side of things. We're called to walk in the spirit. We're called to walk with the Lord. We're called to not to, to forsake those things that we used to do. That's the old man. But some of us, sometimes we go and dig up that old dead body, pick it up and throw, carry it around with us. And we live with this decaying, old, sinful, hum, old man, the old part of us, and, 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 and live with the condemnation that that old man has. In, in Roman times, uh, this is a little bit gruesome, so I won't go too into too, uh, too many details, but uh, one of the Roman punishments would be if you were to murder someone or or kill someone or you were a criminal, that person that you, you murdered would then be, uh, for your punishment, you would be shackled to that dead person to the point where mouth to mouth or ears to ear or eyes to eyes is what it said, and you'd have to carry around this dead corpse uh, for the rest of your life. And your life wouldn't last very long because that decaying body, that rotting body, uh, would start to eat away your flesh. And that's kind of what happens to us, right? We pick up that dead person. We live in the past. We, 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 that, that sin in us that we've sinned, we pick it up and we, we make it our identity. You say, I, I just can't stop looking at porn or I just can't stop doing this thing. I, I can't stop drinking. I can't doing these things. And it's like, that's the old man. Stop picking him up. Cut free the shackles, put to death the old man and live in the newness of life that God has given you. And the only way you can do that is by running to him, by living out his word, by, having, it's by living by faith and what he, is, he says you are and who you are. And leave that old man in the ground. He is dead, rotting, decaying, and it will only cause you harm and destruction. That's why Paul's writing this. You know, it's not like he's writing this because he knew that, that you, everyone in here need to hear this. He's writing this because 2,000 years ago, the church of Colossae needed to hear this because they were going through the same thing. Now the Holy Spirit knew that you'd be sitting here 2,000 years later and that you need to hear it and I needed to hear it and that God was going to use this and preserve his word so that we could be renewed in our minds. And that we just read, if you, if you remember, all of Colossians is talking about Christ above all, the preeminence of Christ, the power of Christ, that he, he's in him, that we are now found in Christ and it's no longer I who live but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith, it says. That Christ is above all and he's more powerful than any sin you could have ever committed. And so leave that old man alone and walk in the newness of life that he's given you. But then he switches gears a little bit in verse 8. And he says, but now you yourselves are to put off all these. So it says, kill the... Put off the old man, kill the old man, and now put off all these, it says, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language, out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds. It's one thing to kill the old man, but to actually then put off, the the word put off, it's like as if taking off the clothes. And notice this, it says, it says, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language, we'll we'll talk about what those mean, but the previous list that we looked at in verses uh, 5 through 7, those dealt with sexual sins, things that were outside of our body, while the list here has to do with our speech. The sexual sin is is personal, uh, and it begins with the thoughts and eventually ends with full-blown sexual immorality, as we talked about, but these sins that it's talking about are social and deal with how we interact with each other. This, this old person of you, is, it affects those around you. Take it off. I, I recently, I, 
I told you guys about the pigeons. You guys remember about the pigeons? For those of you who remember, I, I didn't have to kill them. Uh, but I did have to go up onto my roof. And I had this whole face mask thing, like a long sleeve, these gloves I just covered in, in, to protect myself from uh, the pigeon. I had to go up there and clean up all their mess underneath the solar panels that we have up there, uh, spray down the, the, the nests. And it was just like, it was a lot of hot, dirty work. Um, and it was disgusting. And it all came off our roof and it was just like, then I had to came off my roof and then we had to spray it with this disinfectant and then I had to sweep it all up and then put it in a bag. And, and by the end of it, by the end of it, I stink pretty bad. By the end of it, it I just felt disgusting. Uh, but you know what I did? Uh, so f- I was, I decided, you know what, I'm just going to go in the house and I'm tired and I just want to watch a movie. So I went in the house and just turned on a movie, sat on the couch, and with all that filth, with all that grossness, and don't tell my wife, she doesn't know about this. No, she, no, of course I didn't do that, right? That'd be disgusting. As soon as I got done doing that, what did I do? I didn't even go inside the house. I took off the clothes in the garage. I was like, I don't want this inside the house. It's disgusting. It's not, it, it, it's, it's filth. Is that how you view your, view your sin? These things that are happening, or the, the, the sin that is in you. It's not, you know, Paul says, it, the sin, it's the sin that's in me. It's not me anymore. It's sin in me. But every, every once in a while, I'll, I get angry. And it's not righteous anger. It's sinful anger, right? We mess, like, I'm going down this list. And sometimes I, like, I do these things. And it's like, God, forgive me. I don't keep it on me. I, as soon as that thought comes in, or as soon as I say something, I need to repent of that. Take that off. Take those dirty clothes off and walk in the newness of life. You don't just walk around with your sin and say, justify it. And say, well, this is who I am. I'm just a little grumpy today. I, sh- I haven't eaten. Sorry, I'm hangry. Get over it. No. And this word, so let's go through this list real quick. Anger, it's resentful bitterness. And it, re- it refers to, think of it as like a smoldering. Uh, it's a growing inner anger. That anger or disgust, think about this, guys. That anger or disgust that you get when that specific person that you dislike, when their name comes up, or you see them walking by, or they pop into your conversation, and you're just like, oh, like man, that's what it's talking about. So take that off. Put it off. And it goes wrath, anger. That anger eventually turns to wrath, leads to wrath. Where anger is smoldering and hidden, eventually it will turn into a flame and burst out. The Greek word has to deal with heat, and it, and it is an anger that explodes like, like a volcano. That anger, those thoughts, those emotions, eventually will you'll spew out into wrath. Malice, it means finding humor in another person's misfortune and or an attitude of ill will toward a person. Blasphemy, it's contempt for God or anything sacred. In other versions, uh, it is the word slander. That's what the word here is. Instead of blasphemy, it's slander. It means to speak against and defame another person's character. And gossip, gossip would fall under this cat- category of blasphemy or slander. Do you struggle with that? Put it off. No longer. Christ, you, are a new, you are in Christ. And because you are in Christ, you represent Christ. And that is not how Christ is. And it goes on to say, filthy language out of your mouth. It means foul speaking, obscene speech, coarse or inappropriate humor. Do not lie. It says lying, lying to one another, bearing false witness, any misrepresentation of the truth. Any misrepresentation of the truth is a lie. It's the intent to deceive. Uh, if you want to know more about that, 
you can check out Acts 5 with Ananias and Sapphira uh, when they lied and were deceptive to the Holy Spirit at the early church. That God just dropped them dead. Now, uh, yeah, check it out, Acts 5. But all these things have to deal with the tongue, with our speech, and how we interact with each other. Listen to what James 3 says this about the tongue. It says, even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. You know, a forest fire, right? It starts with a little, a little blaze, a little spark, and all of a sudden it's raging out of control and you, you can't do anything about it. It's taken off and it's just destroying everything in its sight. You ever have that? You have a thought or an idea or you start talking and you can't, you can't control what's coming out of your mouth. It's just spewing anger or lies or whatever it is. And verse 6, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and creature of the sea, is tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no man can tame the tongue. It is un an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. With it, listen to this, with it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives or grapevines bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh. James has, James has a lot to say about the tongue, apparently. And, but it's important. What comes out of your mouth? I gave you that verse, 2 Corinthians 5.21, uh, where, for he made him who knew no sin, no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And I would encourage you to memorize this verse, or at least memorize, if you're a follower of Christ, if you've been born again, that this is how God sees you, that say, then say, when you mess up, when you've sinned against God, because ultimately, when you sin, you're sinning against a holy, perfect God. You say, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And you can't say that boasting. You can't say that, like, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I do whatever I want. No. Read it. Think about it. Meditate on it. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus because of Christ Jesus, because of what he's done in your life. And you realize that like, I have messed up, but by your grace, you have covered me by your blood and so, Lord, forgive me, and I get up, and I walk towards you, and if I need to repent and ask for forgiveness from whoever I've, I've sinned against, I need to go do that and humble myself before him, before them. God resists the proud, and he gives grace to the humble. I, was, I have maybe said this earlier. I've been saying it a while. My, not only does God resist the proud and give grace to the humble, but so does my wife, that when I'm prideful, she's going to resist me. And so do I. When she's prideful, I resist her. When my kids are prideful, I naturally want to resist her. But when one of us humbles ourselves, there's grace. So when I'm, the prideful side of me comes out and my wife shows me humility and doesn't resist me, it humbles me. When she extends grace to me, Lord, forgive me, I have, I have sinned against you and I've sinned against my wife and, and that is not who I am. That is the old person and you move on. You make it right. I had to teach my nine-year-old and my six-year-old this. And we have to do this day in and day out. Watch what you say though. If there are people in your life that you've wronged, that you've sinned against, 
that you've spoken ill against, and they know about it. Go to God first. Humble yourself before him. Ask for forgiveness. Ask him for the wisdom and the courage and the ability to humble yourself before that person. And if they're a brother and sister of the Lord, you just ask for forgiveness. And maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's a friend. Maybe we just went through that whole list and you could think of that. Just humble yourself. It doesn't mean you have to grovel and, and beat yourself, flog yourself. You do what the Lord has called you to do and you walk in obedience towards that and you watch the freedom that comes from it. <laughs> Ephesians 4.25, Therefore, putting away lying, let each of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Proverbs 18, 21 says, death and life are in the power of, of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Speak life, speak truth, speak goodness to one another. Take off the old man. So you see that there's the practical side. When you wake up in the morning, before you get out of bed, say, Lord, put, I, I, I need to put on Christ. I'm putting off the old man. Renew my mind, renew my thoughts. Sometimes you wake up and you just have like a horrible dream. And you're like, you woke up on the wrong side of the bed. You know what I'm talking about? Like, how did I get on this side of the bed? Well, it's such a weird. <laughs> uh, but you, you know what I mean? You wake up and you're just like, oh, this is going to ruin my day. Whatever that thought was, whatever that dream was. Lord, you're bigger than those thoughts. You're bigger than my dreams. I ask for forgiveness. If there's anything I need to for, ask for forgiveness of, today's your mercies are made new every day, and I will walk in your mercies. Fill me with your spirit, and I will walk by faith in what you've done for me. And here we go. And, and then you go brush your teeth, right? Uh, and you go throughout your day. It goes on in verse 10, it says, put on and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. We're going to be talking about this a lot more, putting on the new man uh, in the next couple weeks, but uh, real quick, kill the old you, put off the old man and put on the new man, Okay. The old man's dead. Kill that zombie. Take off the dirty clothes that you have on and put on the new man, okay? Don't just, like, you got to put on Christ. Put on who God says you are. In 2 Corinthians 4, 16, it says, Therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing. The old man is dying. This flesh is dying. The old man is perishing. It's gone, going away. Yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory that we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. If you guys want a verse to meditate on, if you guys want a verse to study, that's the verse. Okay? That's the, will you repeat that? For I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That's focusing on the things that are not seen, un, that are not seen. Focusing on the things that are eternal. Focusing on who Christ says you are. That positionally before God, you have been justified. This is the, the tenses of holiness that we've talked about in the past. That there's three tenses of holiness, of sanctification. That you are, have been justified. That all of your sin has been uh, taken care of. Past, present, and future. 
It's just as if you've never sinned. But now in the present, you're like, I still sin. You are being sanctified. You're being made holy. That God is at work in you. That it, you're being renewed day by day. That your, your thought process is changing. The way you act. The way you deal with people. That you, as you walk in the spirit, you have more love. You have more joy. You have more peace. And you don't have to strive to do these things. That God is doing the work in you as you walk with him. Because the Holy Spirit dwells in you. And he's the one doing the work in you. And then in the future, we will be glorified, whether we die or we get raptured. That we will not have to deal with this sinful nature anymore, that we will be glorified and made whole in heaven. That's what this verse is talking about. But that's the hope that we have, and that's the faith that we live by. And the just shall live by faith. The just shall walk by faith. So faith, your faith is so important. It's not your faith in yourself. It's not your faith in your neighbor. It's not your faith in the world. It's faith in Jesus Christ alone for salvation, for the forgiveness of sins, and for the newness of life that you have. What's it say here? Look at, look at what it says in verse, uh, uh, in verse 10. And have put on the new man who is what? Renewed in knowledge according to the image of him. Knowledge. The, the, knowing God, getting into the word consistently, knowing him is what renews us. I love that God doesn't want us to just be a bunch of brain dead robots. Like he actually wants us to use our brain. He actually wants us to seek after him and get to know him and, and plumb the depths of his wisdom and, his, and who he is and, and have a relationship with him that grows deeper and deeper. And it's not just like, hey, I'm, I've been forgiven of my sins and now I'm going to do whatever I want and that's it. No, it's like he wants us to go deeper with him. And if you're his, if you're a son or daughter of his, that he is going to discipline or chastise or correct you because, because you're his. And he's not okay with you staying the way you are, that he wants you to be set apart, that he wants you to be sanctified, that he wants you to be made holy, and that comes from being close to him. And so he will do things, allow things in your life that will force you to be dependent on him. But you still have a choice to yield, to humble, to follow, to seek after him. In Romans 12, 1, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That you're called to present yourself to him. Now, here I am. Use me however you want, God. To present your members, your body, as a, Lord, for your glory, because you're worth it. Because you're worthy. That word, to be conformed to this world, it means to be like molded or, or like, I, I think of Play-Doh. Like, you know, those molds that you would make, like, you'd make Play-Doh pizza or whatever, and you can make like tomatoes. I think I have tomatoes and mushrooms in my head, but you push the you push the play-doh into the mold, and it you come out with a little mushroom, and you put it on your pepperoni pizza that's made out of play-doh. But that's what it that's a, being conformed or molded into this world. Do not be conformed to this world. It says, "Do not be molded." What are you putting into your mind? What like when you spend your time learning or or with entertainment? Are the, is it the things of this world? Or are you being transformed by the renewing of your mind with God's word? Last, last verse, I'll have the, the worship team come on up. In Romans 6, 11, we're going to break this down a little bit. It says, likewise, you also, here it is again, reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin. I've given you like four different books that have talked about the same thing here. You think it's important? <laughs> Reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
This word reckon, it means uh, it's an accounting term to count, to compute, to calculate. It means to take into account your whole self, all the wrong that you've done, all of your sins from the past, all of the sins you have done and all the sins you will do, weigh it all up and then deem it dead. Determine that no longer lives. Reckon it dead. Reckon yourselves indeed to, dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus the Lord, our Lord. It says, therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lusts, and do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. You are under that unmerited, undeserved grace, favor of God. It's not like we, we hear, we just think grace. Like, no, no, God loves you. He, he has, like, it's his favor that he showers upon you blessings, that he has, like, he's come to give you life and that more abundantly. Like, it's just grace upon grace that we get to live in and we get to walk in, but we, we don't. We don't take it. We don't, we don't, by faith, we need to grab onto that grace and say, all that you have for me, Lord, I'm going to live in, in that new person that you've made in me. And so you present yourselves to him, to, to him and, and all your members is like, here's all that I am. Lord, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to expect. I have nothing to give you. So you do something new out of this, this mess. And he says, great. I can make beauty from ashes. Now just follow me. Just walk with me. I'll do the work, he says. Just seek after me. Delight yourself in me. Get to know me, he says. I'm your father. And as a good father, I know what's best for you. And what's best for you is me, he says. He says, I am your father and I love you and I, am, I, I just want to be with you. I'll do the rest. And what happens is as you get to know him and you get to know his character and his attributes and, and all that he is and you grow in that knowledge of him, you, you become obedient to him. And so those hard things that you have to let go or those hard things that he asks you to do, it's okay because he's right there to do it with you and to give you the strength to do it, to give you the power to do it because it's him doing the work and you just are called to step out in faith and do it. But you got to step out and do it. It says, for sin shall not have dominion over you. The word dominion means like power, authority, strength over you. So I, it took me, sin had dominion over me for many decades. It had power over me. And it was when I said, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus because of who he is and what he's done and not because of anything I could do, that there was freedom and that broke the dominion sin had over me. Live in the newness of life that God has given you. Walk in that. Try him at it. And if you don't know Jesus, if you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ for salvation, for the forgiveness of sins, you can do that tonight. Because you, you still, God will still punish all sin. But do you have the blood of Christ? And if, if you'd like to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'd love to meet you. We'll be in the connect corner, someone with a badge. We'd love, we'd love to walk with you and, and uh, talk to you and pray with you on that. Now let's worship our King. Let's worship our Savior. Let's worship Christ who is preeminent and above all because he is good. Amen? Father, Lord, we thank you for your grace. And Lord, I, Lord as I pray often, Lord, help me to know and understand and grow my understanding of the gospel. Help me to grow my understanding of you. And, and Lord, like, I, I know you more now, but I know that I don't know uh, an iota. I don't know a smidgen. I don't know, I know nothing. But I know I know you more. And the more I know you, the more it changes me from the inside out. Lord, I pray for those here. Lord, I pray that they would grow in the grace and in the knowledge of you, which is freedom, which is peace. 
Lord, I, I pray that as we worship you now in song, Lord, that we would, you would calm our minds and our hearts and we would be able to focus on, on you by your spirit. And that we would worship you in spirit and truth. And that whatever's been hindering us, whatever's been holding us back, if there's anyone here that's just been feeling condemned or accused, Lord, you said there's no condemnation in Christ. You don't, you don't accuse. Lord, Satan's the great accuser. If anyone feels accused or, or, or condemned, that's, that's a work of the devil. And Lord, we rebuke that in the name of Jesus and we say, Lord, there, where the Spirit is, there's freedom. Where the Spirit, there is liberty. And so, Lord, we want to worship you in spirit and truth now. Help us to, in Jesus' name.